Welcome to Good Game, I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. Bajo, there's always a bit of excitement when mail gets delivered to the Good Game office, but this week we saw some particularly anticipated deliveries. Oh Hex, oh Hex, I've never been so excited about the ABC delivery system before. This week we got copies of some huge games, including Lara Croft's new adventure, Rise of the Tomb Raider. <laughs> So in this week's inbox is a reboot of a game that I'm just not sure really needed a reboot. It's Need for Speed. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? What's that word for something's clever and short? Another big game that only just came in is Fallout 4. So we'll have a full review of that next week, but Hex, I played a few hours and I really need to talk about no, it. No, no, I haven't started yet. I don't want any spoilers. I want to talk about it. Go talk to Nick. He's been streaming it before the show. All right. <laughs> oh, bottle cap. Go, vent. Death Claws! Death Claws, Hex! Death Claws! Hi, Nick Boy. Bajo. We've both been playing Fallout 4. We have. Yeah, you've been streaming it on Pocket? I have. What do you think? <laughs> the game's really good. <laughs> it's really fun. It's so big. It's so big. Oh. Is here for you. Just this All new residents, please proceed in an orderly fashion. It's, it's going to destroy us, isn't it? Yeah, but <laughs> what but what I love from the beginning is that it has context. Ah, oh, good morning, Mum. With the older game, I was someone who was sort of just dropped into this world and it was just like, oh, none of this makes any sense. Whereas even with the small amount of sort of preamble at the beginning of this one, looks like the milk got delivered. I at least understand the world that I lost, so then it makes it kind of more heartbreaking to be wandering around it. And, and it's affecting too. Yeah. Oh my God! When you're going into the vault, you're just like, they're closing above you and yeah. you're seeing everything wiped out. That was it's chilling. That was a, a legitimately affecting moment. Everybody's dead. Everybody's like, gone. <laughs> I, I am not dead thanks to two meters. Hun? Everyone, this just head up home. these stairs and through the door there. And I like that you can actually character customize your wife and the man. Like if you're playing as the man. My turn, big guy. Your wife can be changed and that's in the whole initial part as well. So Absolutely. you're basically building both of them. vault calling. Remind me again. It's, it's a little weird when I was actually like changing someone's face. my nose is too big. And then their partner's just in the background, <laughs> like I was, I was changing the woman's hair. New hairstyle? And he's like, looking good, baby. And I was like, no, no, that does not look good. Did I mention how much I love your new hairstyle? It's especially weird when you make the kind of characters that I make in games. Abominations. <laughs> oh, that's the face I fell in love with. There are so many blemish options. It's wonderful. I've been trying for days. It's a matter of utmost urgency, I assure you. Then I'm glad you caught up with me. Those raiders that killed Mary? They took her locket, too. Uh, do you know where they're coming from? Yeah, pretty sure I do. You spend some time in the vault, mm -hmm. and then you come out of the vault, mm -hmm. and then the game really begins. Yeah. Where did it take you, first off? I immediately went back to my house. I really liked that as a device, because it was, like, again, like I said, the before and after. But then I also looted uh, all the houses around me, because yeah. I figured my neighbours are all dead. They don't need their stuff. I need their stuff. Yeah. And so I went through like three or four houses, uh, but then I was like, I could probably do this to every house in the neighborhood, but I'm sure that the developers know that I might get tired of that three to four houses in, so hopefully they just put the good stuff up in my house. <laughs> What I liked is you can do the house building stuff straight away. And that's a big part of this Fallout game is you can build a house and you can build a community around that house and get vendors and get people to come in. It's so deep, this house building mm. stuff. One thing I really loved about it was you can mount heads on walls yeah, of the creatures you've killed if you've killed enough of them and you've got the mats. So yeah. I put a little mole rat guy yeah, on the nice. wall and that made me really happy. Putting together a home again after this disastrous event, that can be your whole game from the beginning. Yeah, and, and I they, think that's great. They really give you a taste of all the different stuff at the top. One thing that you kind of led towards is a town called Concord in the mm. first hour of play. And, and in Concord, you have like all the story interactions with this bunch of survivors. Man, I don't know who you are, but your time is impeccable. It really shows you all the kind of choice consequence stuff with the dialogue options and yeah. how that's evolved. Minutemen? So now nope. I'm traveling backward in time? Protect the people at a minute's notice. It's very Bioware now for a Bethesda game, which is already kind of Bioware-ish. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And so. I like that it never sort of flags it as being like, this is an important moment. It's yeah. kind of like, I would say something sort of sassy. Visions. Uh-huh. And their reaction would be, you know, in one way. And I'm kind of like, 
oh, I think I'm going to regret that. Yeah. Like that, maybe that wasn't <laughs> the best thing to say to this dying woman. Uh, and and but the game didn't tell me that was important. I just went, yeah, that was a mistake. The thing that really struck me was as I was going through these dialogue options, mm. my companion didn't like some of the choices I was making. Ooh. It can actually leave you if you make them unhappy enough. Seriously? So if, yeah. If you choose heaps of choices to make them hate you, they will leave you and they will never come back. Things have certainly changed and not for the better. I have the dog as a companion, yeah. and I, I, d I don't want the dog to leave me. <laughs> he's, so, he's, so cool. he's so cool. And uh, and I like that this dog is actually useful from yeah. the beginning. Not only does he find stuff for you, but in fights he is attacking enemies, taking them down, like pinning them for you and that sort of stuff. And every time I'm in a fight and I hear a whimper, like I could be over here attacking these guys and I hear a whimper and I'm like, get away from him! <laughs> and I spin around. You already love it. Yeah, I'm so protective of him. <laughs> So I would never make any decision that would make my dog leave me. <laughs> I love how the combat has evolved. But also the VAT system has been improved because now it's it's not pausing time, it's slowing down time. And I yeah. thought, when I saw the original footage of that, I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. But now when you have like a Yelgwai or a Deathclaw coming at you in slow motion, you're like, just gonna pick which part I'm gonna shoot you. And also, it's really stressful. Those fast enemies that they sort of get up on you, by the time you've activated that, it's like he was there, yeah. and then you activate and it's sort of here. Yeah. And then it starts going like, you've got a like a 90% chance to hit 75, <laughs> yeah. 30. And then it's like, I didn't select it fast enough. It goes, you cannot hit it now. And I'm like, no, the face. <laughs> The thing I find with these games, which for me is daunting, is is the amount of game that's here. I yeah. can get overwhelmed. I find that it is so easy to get distracted here. Going to Concord and um, meeting those guys for the first time, there were raiders attacking them. I go, okay, I'm going to try and flank them. I find these cellar doors in the building next to them. I thought I could go down there and then pop up into the building. I open up the cellar doors and I go in, and there's a whole, like, metro system underground. And yeah. I was like, oh, I'm just going to back away now. That's the beauty of these games, mm. though, and Skyrim as well. You know, these are such massive games, and there's so much content there. I actually quite like that I don't need to do all of it. Yeah. It is so big that I might miss an entire vault and an entire storyline in there, and that's fine, yeah. because that's my journey that I'm going on with this particular game. Because you're kind of an archaeologist, you know, in a way, mm. digging up the past while also trying to survive and solve mysteries. You're like an archaeologist and a detective. Sir, I do believe you took that terminal once more. And also, I, I like that the story, which, you know, we're not going to talk about, but it's a simple premise, and I like those for these big games. Yeah. I like that it's not getting stuck down in lore, it's not getting stuck down in, like, a lot of different factions fighting each other, whatever. It's kind of like, it's it's almost the simplest story you could make, yeah. and so it feels very directed. So at any point, while I get completely lost on all these things, it's like, no, I'm just going to come back to the one thing that yeah. I need to You've do. You've always got that in the back of your mind. And the thing, this thing that, this driving force for my character. And I think mm. that not only is it simple, but it is, it's, it's actually powerful. Help me pack it up. Obviously, there is a lot to talk about with this game, and Hex and I will have our full review next week. Yeah, but if you want to see more of the game right now, then my Pocket live stream is archived on our YouTube page, on the Good Game YouTube page, so you can see the first few hours of the game there. Thanks for joining us, Nick. I really needed to talk about... Just needed to vent. Game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go back to studio now. Yeah, you go now. Bye. Where's the controller? Thank you. Much better, Hex. Out of your system? Yeah, totally. For now. All right, well, here's Goose with the news. Here's what's making headlines. Nintendo has announced its first ever smartphone game, Mitomo, due for release early next year. The free-to-play game will incorporate Mii characters in a social sim along the lines of Tomodachi life. Nintendo's investors did not receive the news well, with the announcement causing a 10% fall in the company's share price. <laughs> And in more mobile gaming news, Activision Blizzard has invested heavily in the market, acquiring successful Candy Crush creators King for 5.9 billion US dollars. Activision hopes the purchase will enable it to expand the same market-leading success it currently enjoys with brands like Call of Duty and Warcraft into the smartphone category. Details of the purchase are still being finalised, but the deal is expected to be concluded in the second half of next year. 
Reports are circulating that Konami has closed its Los Angeles studio, which had recently completed work on Metal Gear Online. Sources close to the matter have revealed via social media and gaming websites that the LA studio has shut down, making more than 20 staff redundant. Continued support for Metal Gear Online will reportedly be provided by the publisher's Japanese studio. Well, morale taken care of. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. Welcome to a post-apocalyptic world where the sun is dying and the few remaining survivors are sick, fully sick. It's Need for Speed, brah. Gotta bust up that chassis. Yep. Destroy those wheels. Bang limiter and shred those tires. Yeah. yeah. You think you're ready for that? Push it to the limit yes. if you wanna win it. Uh, harbor no room for the weak nor the timid. Been too long, you got accustomed to the gimmicks. It's like they don't care that the real is at the finish. Uh, no blemish, Woo. no honor. Uh, let the blues go, the snake charm. Uh, the kingpin of every street corner. You can't say I didn't ever warn you. Yeah. Yes, after the series took a year off, it's back with a sort of reboot. Is it a reboot though, Hex? Is it really? I mean, firstly, a year off is hardly enough time for a reboot justification. I mean, that's just an annual instalment, really. And secondly, this feels more like a sequel I'd expect from an Eva Speed franchise. Well, I think after the series jumped around in so many directions, they're trying to focus in on that core street racing culture. So I'd be interested to see if they stick with this style in the future. Yeah, time will tell. Props on the skill, man. But for this game, we find ourselves in Ventura Bay, AKA not Los Angeles, where the sun never rises. Well, sometimes it creeps over the horizon only to be squashed back into the darkness from whence it came. I just wish the sun came out at least once. Yeah, but it looks so good at night with all the puddles and the lights and the reflections. Yeah, it does look great. And I even got used to that slight film grain over everything. Also, the constant night time helps to justify the fact that the streets are always so empty. There's barely any traffic on the roads. Yeah, it does feel very quiet, doesn't it? I think a little bit more traffic would have helped make that moment-to-moment -moment action a bit more exciting. Yeah, this game isn't going to recreate the kind of stress you get from Most Wanted, for example, but I also think that's on purpose, so let you focus in on the racing. One of the biggest additions is now there's a sort of story told with full motion video. V, by, O, <laughs> fun. Hello, ladies. <laughs> yes, everything is told through your perspective as a group of fully sick racers guide you through the various aspects of street racing. So you've got the guy who's all about speed. When we smash that legendary runner for you, they'll have to come back at us. Or the girl who loves to build cars. Uh, oh, this is my latest obsession. And each of them is aspiring to be like some real-world racing icon. So your style guy is obsessed with impressing Ken Block, for example. You're gonna make me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> Hex, Seriously? all of these characters that are in your crew, I hate them all so much, <laughs> especially this guy. Oh, my man, you made it. Yeah. And also, they just sit there chugging energy drinks and spouting some of the stupidest words I've ever heard. Rep, you need to get the cash to build a ride like that. Now that's something that takes commitment. <laughs> Sorry, man. I ruined it, didn't I? Yeah. This guy, man. Yeah, their dialogue is hardly poetry. <laughs> hmm. Poetry, you say? See, like this. This rim would give Amy an aneurysm. Like, totally. I was maxing at the diner, and I caught this hype. Some asshead train on the freeway. Guess my invite got lost. I mean, the dialogue is so bad. And to me, it just reeks of a bunch of adults that have tried to write dialogue that'll appeal to 14-year-old boys and just failed massively at it. And the result is something that's quite patronising to anyone who picks up this game. Maybe one of these mongrels would take a shine to you. And I think the other problem is it feels weird to have all these characters constantly talking to you and about you, but you're this silent protagonist. Yeah, it is a bit weird, isn't it? That could work really well in other games where you're in-game and moving about and directing the action. Look at Half-Life, for example. But when it's full motion video cutscenes and you're just not saying anything, it's so strange. <laughs> what did you think of the whole story idea overall? I mean, I wouldn't really call this a story. The characters are mostly there to simply set up the next series of events. You with me? I mean, there's no big dramatic plot or anything that strings it all together. Yeah, one thing that really bothered me was just how often all the characters call you. It's constant when you're busy as well. 
the phone is just constantly buzzing. And then you pick it up, and they're in the middle of having conversations with other people. I just don't get it. Someone's got to know something. Boy, well, it wouldn't be a very good super secret underground outlaw dude if everybody Rude. Did. I just think it would have helped a lot if your character said something. Maybe, maybe give them a few dialogue options in the cutscenes. Really? I mean, do you want this to be the Mass Effect or Walking Dead of races? Yeah, that'd be awesome. <clears throat> Tonight, we ride. You can show us what you're really made of, yeah? Yeah, man. But you know what, I do commend them for at least trying something different with this narrative style. And maybe they didn't quite nail it, but you know, that's more than most racers do. Well, let's talk about the actual racing. Yes, my first impression of the racing in this game, Hex, was just how great the handling was and how good these cars felt. Perfect for this kind of game. And now there's a slider where you can quickly set how grippy or drifty you'd like your cars to behave. You can also fine tune all the individual settings so you can get the feeling just the way you like it. As a result, I think this game has some of the most satisfying drifts ever. Yeah, and it's a good thing too, since almost half the events are all about racking up drifts to get high scores. Usually I'm not a big fan of drift events in races, but they're actually quite fun here. Yeah, I really like the structure of this game too. It's not about unlocking as many cars as possible and collecting them. It's about getting four or five that you really, really like and just modding and tweaking them and kind of going on a journey with those cars. Also, I found a decal that looks just like my cat. Sick ride, Barjo. In general, I found most of the events a bit too easy though, and I'm not even that great at races. But I always had loads of time to spare in time trials and could easily score huge points in drift events. I know what you mean. I think most of the challenge will come from trying to beat your friend's scores as opposed to trying to beat the AI. And I actually think the AI is borderline broken at times. Sometimes the game didn't seem to know what position the AI was even in. And once an AI racer in front of me simply turned around. There's also some serious rubber banding here, which takes a bit of the skill out of the races. Yeah, and there were some technical hiccups as well. For example, at one point I started a race and the game forcibly shoved me and all the other drivers into a barrier. Also, we reviewed this on PS4 and after a few hours of playing, we started to find some races would cause the frame rate to tank. I mean, mostly it was smooth sailing, but it can get pretty chuggy at times. Yeah, and for some reason this game is always online. If you're not online, you can't play it. Yeah, but I don't get why though, Bajo. There's a play solo mode. Why not let people play that offline if they want to? Did EA learn nothing from SimCity? No one likes it. Stop doing it. Yeah, well, we didn't have any connection issues, but I just don't see why they force you to go online at all. Gotta see these mad skills for myself. By default, you'll find other players just hooning around the world and having constant access to leaderboards and that kind of thing. But I just don't see enough here to justify it always being online. It is running on dedicated servers though, apparently, which is always a bonus. But we should wrap this up. Hex, final thoughts? Well, it is super pretty and it handles beautifully. That said, the characters in the story totally missed the mark and the actual racing kind of left a lot to be desired, so I'm giving it three out of five stars. Yeah, there is a lot to like here. The handling, as you say, and all that tweaking and the modding. But yeah, I just could not warm to this game and I tried hard because I'm a huge fan of this series, so I'm going to give it three as well. See, like this? <laughs> this rim would give Amy an aneurysm. Like, totally. <laughs> but these dudes, they wear their scars as a mark of pride. Are you going on another adventure? Laura, listen to me. Someday, you're going to make such a mark on this world. You're going to make me so proud. Give me a moment, darling. I need to take this. Everyone else who was wrong. Where is the artifact? I don't care if it's real. I've lost too many friends. I don't want to lose you. Too. Don't go down this road. You know where it leads. Yes, Rise of the Tomb Raider, a.k.a. Magical Hair Simulator 2015, has come crashing onto our consoles. And 
it's pretty spectacular. It's magnificent, isn't it? Should we get our new gen graphics froth out of the way, just up front? Why not? Oh my gosh, the light. Oh, it's beautiful. The way it shines it's so through the trees. The and detail, then when you're looking over the those landscapes, oh, it's kind of like skin, sunsets and, and, and the everything. Motion capture, and then, you know, and her hair and everything. And, and it's just like her eyes look incredible. real when she's talking. I wish talking. I had hair like that. Oh my gosh. You know, I don't think I've ever played a game that actually makes you feel cold. But this one does. The weather feels so reactive, so wild. And the way she hugs herself and shakes against the elements. Go back. Please don't try to find me. I, mean, I was shivering with her. All of her movements look and feel so real. The motion capture is stunningly detailed. And it's all complemented so cinematically by the way the camera moves around her. It's so sophisticated and intuitive. Remember when we used to complain about camera controls in games? It's just so good now. Let's just stop for a moment and appreciate that. I don't want to take it for granted because it's so important to how you move through this environment. Yeah, speaking of which, what environments? Lara's journey this time takes her from Syria to Siberia. Oh, and the landscapes. If I may slow pan. I'd be upset if you didn't. the story. A Byzantine war galley. Lara is looking to uncover the ancient myths of the world after her supernatural experience on Yamatai is covered up by the organization known as Trinity. Set the charges! This time she has her sights set on the secret of immortality. It would change everything. Sickness, suffering, death, gone. Are you listening to yourself? Naturally, so do the bad guys. So, like all good archaeological adventure tales, it becomes a race to see who can find the magical object first. It's a cliche, but one we love and accept, isn't it? Yeah, and I didn't mind it at all. In fact, this time around, I found the story much easier to digest. There are fewer characters, so it doesn't get overcomplicated. And the ones that do come into play are well fleshed out and believable. I am not your enemy. That remains to be seen. I also really liked the villains. I found them powerful and threatening. <laughs> Our goal is within reach, but we must be vigilant. And multi-dimensional too. We may scoff at audio logs, but they are a way to make all the intricate details of the plot entirely optional. They're there for you to seek out well, if you choose. In place within the main cavern, we intend to gain access. But when I did listen to them, I found they gave real depth to the motivation of Lara's enemies. They're not just evil for evil's sake. I wish I could make her understand just how wrong she is. How misguided her ideas of morality are. The world is too flawed for stopgaps. Refreshing. This was such an exciting journey into the wilderness. You get that real buzz from wandering into some long lost civilization. And for me, it really harkened back to those original Tomb Raider days. Yeah, I mean, the last game did a lot to set Lara on a path of transformation from archaeologist to adventurer. But it's great to see her now much stronger and more confident, nerding out with her wealth of historical knowledge and, of course, her now keen survivor skills. In fact, early on, she just ditches her giant man friend to go it alone and get it done. I need to do this alone. Yes, although you will be starting from scratch despite all the mad survival skills that you learned in the last game. I know you have to be drip-fed skills to have a decent challenge progression, but it's just one of those gamey things that irks me a little. Yeah, but I think it makes sense since these are all tool-specific skills. And she's of course landed back in the wilderness without any of her gear. Yeah, but I'm stabbing dudes and gutting animals with my various tools, and yet I can't cut rope. I need a special knife just for that. Yeah, but I mean, it's not about that. She's like Bear Grylls or MacGyver. She needs to craft and scavenge all of her special bits and bobs to make a bow out of sticks and paper clips. Going to need a stronger bow. Okay, maybe not paper clips, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Take this. Similar to the first game, there will be certain areas that you can't access and certain challenges you can't do until you have the right tool. <laughs> which may frustrate some people, but I think it's a good reward structure and it does encourage you to go back to other locations and clear tombs or dig up collectibles. Speaking of tombs, there are some wonderful puzzles here. 
nothing brain breaking, but enough to get you thinking laterally with water and pulleys without breaking the flow of the action too much. Many of the tombs are optional, but the reward you get from them are super useful perks, so you'll want to go for all of them. Looks to be a treatise on the connection between the body and the mind. I like that the entrances are hidden too, it's all part of the puzzle. Yeah, I got seriously lost in some of those mines and tunnels though. For me, the challenge wasn't finding the tomb, it was finding my way back out again. Unlocking your map makes it all a bit easier though. In each area, you'll have a map to find, and that will reveal where all the hidden treasures are. And point out the location of tomb entrances. There's loads to seek out with your survival instincts. I did find spamming the right stick for survival mode did get a little tiresome. Because if you're not constantly pressing it, you'll inevitably miss something. It's a small annoyance, really. It's just something that I think other games do a little bit better. Yeah, I like it when they put a glisten over the thing you need to pick up, like the Uncharted games do. One thing I love about this game, though, is that everything that you find and dig up is all about increasing Lara's understanding and knowledge. I can't quite make out the translation of this word. She levels up her Greek and Russian when she comes across ancient scripts. And all the little stories behind each archaeological item she discovers. I saw it here. Camilla Luddington does a great job of bringing Lara to life once again. Listen to this. I just love the way she makes each and every little item sound like the most exciting treasure. The technique survived migration halfway around the world. They're all a bit melodramatic in the cutscenes though, aren't they? Yeah, with Lara the intensity is always at 11. Oh, I just have to start a fire. <laughs> gotta really, I've gotta look at these books and just gotta <laughs> learn some more Greek. <laughs> Need to rest. So cold. Uh, what did you think about the controls? Oh, they're great. I love them. She's just so agile. So much so that you have to be really careful about how you navigate her. Holy shit! I don't think I can make that jump! Yeah, and you know, at first I thought these movements were a little too sensitive. If you don't perfectly guide her towards each climbing point, she'll just go flying off in another direction. And often she won't naturally latch onto things that you think she will. Which was kind of frustrating. Yeah, I love that though. It's another thing that harkens back to the original games. High stakes, you know, one false step means death. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. It just took some getting used to. You know, more often than not now, devs will program these mechanics to be a little bit more forgiving. Guiding characters towards the closest point or stopping you from jumping off anything that you shouldn't. <sighs> But Lara isn't like that, and you're right, it's good that it's that way. Yeah, it makes you more focused, more careful, and you know, it's not punishing or unintuitive either. No, and it's actually a nice contrast to those more guided cinematic moments in the game, of which there are a lot, particularly in those transitional action sequences. Coming off the back of a parkour game like Assassin's Creed last week, it's a bit of an adjustment. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Though when it comes to swimming, I like that the controls are super simple. Just one button to dive and another to go faster. And swimming is the one area in a game where you want those controls to be as simple as possible. Yeah, but why can't she hold her breath for more than like five seconds? Maybe it's because the developers know that swimming is always annoying, so they want you to do it as little as possible. Let's talk about the combat. Ah, oh, Bajo, once again this game hits such a great balance for me. While I often felt the Uncharted games got a bit too repetitive with their cover shooter sections, here every enemy encounter has the opportunity to be unique and different. Yeah, Lara is strong, but let's face it, she often finds herself in strange parts of the world, facing hundreds of military trained goons for some reason. Move out, make it quick. So she needs to be clever about how she approaches fights. Yeah, having a female protagonist is awesome, but physically she doesn't match her opponents. So this means lots of clever stealth kills, bombs and molotovs, and an eclectic range of weapons to choose from. Bajo, I rarely go nuts on weapons. In most cases, for me, guns are guns. But I can honestly say I have never had more fun with weapons in a game. Shotguns and rifles, that deadly compound bow with its poison arrows and exploding arrows. It's great. Plus, so often in games, they give you a whole bunch of things and you only end up using one or two. But it's not the case here at all. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's just fun. The variety in these fights is just so well implemented. And there's a great range of upgrades for your gear, as well as new items to piece together as a reward for all your diligent exploring. I always appreciate it too when games give you options when it comes to combat. You can choose to focus more on strategic stealth 
or wreak havoc with whatever you have handy. Oh man, one of my favourite perks is the one where you can turn bodies of fallen goons into poison bombs. And they beep to draw the attention of other enemies so that when they wander over to inspect, poof, they die in a cloud of poison. What? There are a few contrived red barrel scenarios, but I'd be lying if I said they weren't satisfying to take advantage of. You said we'd find out soon enough. Even funnier are those moments where it's really obvious, like when the goons are saying, looks like we've got a fuel leak, let's all just keep standing in this highly flammable liquid. It's so dangerous. Looks like we got another fuel leak. We gotta solve this oh. out before something bad happens. We're under attack! <laughs> Classic goons. Yeah, although Lara meets her fair share of untimely demises as well, in what seems to be becoming a bit of a signature for these new games, it's Lara getting her face impaled on a pike. <laughs> Ouch. Serious ouch. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about the untimely demise of these chickens. Well, you do kill a lot of animals in this game, from bears to mountain cats, but it's all part of your fight to survive. I will admit, I threw a few of those chickens off cliffs though and that had nothing to do with survival. <laughs> Well, should we talk about the fact that Tomb Raider this time is actually going to be an Xbox exclusive for the next few months at least, delaying its release on all the other platforms? I don't like this. You know, with the first game, it was on everything, and then the second one isn't on everything, not at first at least. That just seems strange to me. It seems like a bit of a cheap money grab, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I know that certain consoles have their, you know, exclusives. PlayStation obviously has Uncharted, and maybe they wanted Tomb Raider to be that, and this is kind of a last-ditch attempt to get that Christmas rush, but... Yeah. I don't know, is it fair? No, it's just mean PR marketing. And who knows who paid for it, though? Maybe they paid an awful lot of money for it, and that's why the game is so good. That could be a factor, in which case, I would find that acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had an incredible adventure with this game. The controller could not be pried from my fingers once I started. I was in the zone. The story was exciting. As you said, it was a better narrative, and I felt really driven to complete all the extra content and earn every perk and draw out the experience to make it last. It's a bigger world too, and a longer game than the last one, so there's a lot to lose yourself in. Lara has really come into her own now, and it feels genuinely exciting to be going on this journey with her. This is a fantastic continuation of a great reboot, but best of all, it's starting to call back to some of those old school Tomb Raider elements that I just love. I'm giving it five out of five stars. Yes, I was hoping you would. I'm giving it five out of five as well. And what better way to celebrate double fives than by honoring one of this game's greatest achievements, fabulous hair. Kenny G. <laughs> so tell me, viewers, did you name the game for this week? It was Discworld 2 Missing Presumed. First released in 1996 on PC and then a year later on PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. In this point and click adventure, you took on the role of the wizard Rincewind, who must convince Death to come out of retirement and resume his deadly duties. And it's our name the game because it was based on the Discworld novels written by Terry Pratchett, whose daughter Rihanna wrote this week's Rise of the Tomb Raider. Next week on the show, no more first plays, it's the real deal. We bring you our full review of Fallout 4. Let's go, boy. And what happens when you take man and you take machine and you blow those lines again in Black Ops 3? What happens when the soldier becomes the weapon? Don't forget, you can also see Nick Boy streaming many games, including Fallout 4, over on Pocket, which you can find on iView and YouTube. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bardo out. Do you ever wish you had long hair, like for realsies? Mm, it's a lot of work to keep it clean, right? To keep it clean? Yeah, because you, like, you you're bending over getting it, it in like your you food, right? you wash everything else.
why would I get in your food? Mm -hmm. 